a member of the board of IIEA, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA, IIEA webinar, which is co-organized and sponsored by Janssen, which is the pharmaceutical division of Johnson & Johnson. Um, I'm going to start just giving a little background to the IIEA itself, because we have some people joining us today who may not be familiar with us. So IIEA is the Institute of International and European Affairs. It's Ireland's leading international affairs think tank and an independent not-for-profit organization. Our aim is to provide a forum for all those interested in EU and international affairs to engage in debate and discussion and to evaluate and share policy options. So in line with that mission, this afternoon session addresses the important area of cancer care and policy. Every year, 3.5 million people in the EU are diagnosed with cancer. And unfortunately, we lose 1.3 million people every year to cancer across the union. And we also know that 40% of cancer cases are preventable. So in that context, we're going to be uh, talking about Europe's Beating Cancer Plan that was launched in February 2021 and is the EU's response to growing challenges and developments in cancer control. This plan forms part of the EU Commission's proposal for a strong European health union with a view to ensuring a more secure, better prepared and more resilient EU. So we're delighted today that our expert panel today will give us policy, clinical, patient and industry perspectives on Europe's Beating Cancer Plan and discuss how we can shape the future of national cancer care and policy in Ireland. The panel will also compare Ireland's performance to that of its European counterparts in terms of cancer care outcomes and the lessons to be learned to improve cancer care for patients in Ireland. So the, our expert panelists have been very generous with time include Matthias Schuppe, who is project leader for the Cancer Task Force with DJ Sante in the European Commission, Anouk de Bray, who's Senior Director of Government Affairs and Policy with Johnson & Johnson, Professor John Crown, who's professor and consultant medical oncologist with St. Vincent's University Hospital, and Rachel Morrow, Executive Director of Advocacy and External Relations with the Irish Cancer Society. So I'll just tell you what's going to happen in the next hour and a half. Our panelists will each speak to us for about seven minutes, and then we go to the Q&A with our audience. The panel's opening remarks there will take about 30 minutes, and then we move on to the Q&A part, and that will allow us to continue the discussion uh, up to when we'll draw proceedings to a close no later than 2.30 p.m. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which I hope you're all familiar with, and you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to them once the panelists have finished the remarks. I'd ask you in your question to identify yourself in your affiliation, if any, when asking your question, and you might let us know if you want to direct your question on the individual panelist or to all the panel. You might let us know that. A reminder that today's presentation and webinar and the Q&A are both on the record. And as ever, feel free to join the discussion on Twitter. And we ask you to use the handle at IIEA. As this event is public, we're also live streaming this afternoon's discussion. So a very warm welcome to all of you tuning in via YouTube. And I'm going to uh, introduce each of our speakers in turn. So our first speaker will be Matthias Schuppe. Matthias is the project leader of the Cancer Task Force in DG Sante at the European Commission. Matthias has over eight years experience in policy and project management at the Commission. Previously, he worked for the European Public Health Alliance and the European Health Forum Gastein. He holds an MSc in Health Services and Systems Research from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine at the University of London. Matthias, we're delighted to have you and over to you. Thank you and good afternoon. I will share my screen for the presentation. There we go. Okay, Have thank you. So next slide, please. So um, the plan has 10 flagships and uh, 32 other actions that cover each key stage of the disease and incorporates also the lessons learned from the uh, pandemic so far, uh, and I will um, explain that a little bit later, and has a dedicated budget of 4 billion euro, um, coming from several different EU funding instruments. Next slide, please. Um, looking at the plan in more detail, and I will not go into all these 32 actions, I will focus on the flagships. Um, we have a, a flagship on the Knowledge Center on Cancer that was already established as part of the joint research centers of the Commission and was launched in June 2021 uh, with the focus of uh, facilitating synergies between the different EU level actions that are part of the plan. We will also launch next year European Cancer Imaging Initiative 
um, which I will explain a little bit more in detail when we get to that particular pillar. Next slide, please. Now, looking at prevention, uh, we have a flagship initiative of uh, eliminating cervical cancer through action on HPV vaccination for both boys and girls. Um, this is in line with the WHO targets to reach a 90% vaccination rate for, for girls. And for boys, we want to increase substantially the vaccination rates that exist at the moment. Um, in the prevention area, the plan um, takes the similar or same holistic approach as through the cancer continuum, covering uh, actions that focus on very different risk factors. Uh, on tobacco, for instance, alcohol consumption, uh, healthy diets, physical activity, but also air quality and exposure to, uh, of workers to haz hazardous substances. Um, this is complemented by the European Code Against Cancer, which will be updated and should help uh, individual citizens to um, understand their cancer risk and try to reduce their cancer risk. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, early detection, the plan has a flagship of a new, establishing a new cancer screening scheme, uh, which builds on several elements. The first one is an update of the 2003 Council recommend recommendation on cancer screening, uh, which at the moment recommends uh, breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening, and to explore and ass assess the scientific evidence uh, to potentially expand this coverage to other types of cancers. Secondly, uh, the implementation and rollout of uh, guidelines and quality assurance schemes covering uh, breast, colorectal, and cervical cancer. Um, the uh, guidelines and the quality assurance scheme for breast cancer has already been launched, and we are now implementing that through the EU health program, whereas the, the schemes for colorectal and cervical cancer will be developed in the coming years. And then the European Cancer Imaging Initiative uh, with a focus to uh, provide an ecosystem to test new tools, uh, for instance, using artificial intelligence to improve uh, imaging methodology. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, diagnosis and treatment, uh, three key flagship actions. Uh, the first, uh, supporting EU member states in creating national comprehensive cancer centers or infrastructures and networking these at EU level. Uh, secondly, through the Cancer Diagnostic and Treatment for All initiative, um, trying to make um, the most advanced diagnostics and treatments available to more EU citizens. And as part of the um, mission on cancer uh, that is launched under the Horizon Europe program and was adopted on the 29th of September, an action to better understand cancer uh, in the sense that we want to understand how it develops, how it spreads in the human body. Other areas focus then on training measures as well, on your new European reference networks on specific cancer types and also on radionuclear medicine. Next slide, please. Um, coming to the last pillar, uh, we want to also um, improve uh, the life of cancer patients, survivors, and the carers uh, through initiatives establishing a cancer survivor smart card and the European Patient Digital Center, which again, which again is an action of the uh, Horizon Europe mission on cancer, and also explore a solution to uh, ensure fair access for cancer survivors to financial services, uh, such as mortgage insurance, for instance. Um, linked to that is also an implementation of the Directive on Work-Life Balance for Parents and Carers. Next slide. Reducing inequalities. Um, we are establishing a cancer inequality registry that should monitor the trends in member states on key cancer indicators and also uh, provide analysis in which areas further investment will be needed, both at EU and at national level. Other actions, for instance, uh, to uh, support the rollout of telemedicine, uh, virtual consultation models of the existing ERN networks uh, should help to improve member states' um, preparedness in terms of pandemics um, and is a response to what we have learned uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. Next slide, please. And then uh, the last pillar, perhaps, or the last cross-cutting action of the plan 
uh, the childhood cancer um, <clears throat> focus on establishing uh, a, un a new EU network of youth cancer survivors uh, as the survivor's card and also action under the mission on cancer to address ch childhood cancer. Next slide, please. Now for the plan, excuse me, we have set up three different groups uh, to uh, improve or facilitate the running and implementation of the plan. Um, the first one is a member state group and here under the existing steering group on health promotion and disease prevention, um, a subgroup on cancer was established that brings together member state representatives from the ministries of health and, and research to focus both on the implementation of the cancer plan and the cancer mission. Secondly, and this is at commission level, we have established an implementation group. This is basically to bring together all different commission departments that are responsible for implementing actions of the plan uh, to uh, collaborate and synergize better. And this group is also um, preparing an implementation roadmap that will outline in more detail key um, deliverables and times, timelines for the action of the plan. And last but not least, a stakeholder contact group uh, for engagement with civil society at large, um, for which we are now in the process of establishing also thematic uh, working groups that would follow the different uh, pillars of the plan as I have outlined them before. Next slide. Um, now, implementation. Um, one key funding instrument of the plan is the EU for Health program. And under the work plan 2021, we have already launched a significant number of calls. A first wave was launched in July and has already closed on the 15th of, Sem uh, of September, focusing on the quality and safety of radiation technology uh, in cancer um, diagnosis and treatment an update of the European cancer information system to include um, a new system of monitoring cancer screening programs, the uh, training component, for instance, but also the EU network of youth cancer survivors. Um, a second wave uh, has been launched this month on the 14th of October, uh, being open until the 25th of January, focusing on HPV vaccination um, uh, dissemination of the European Code Against Cancer, actions to address liver and gastric cancers caused by infections, the Healthy Lifestyle for All initiative that was launched by the Commission on the 23rd of September, uh, the quality assurance schemes that I mentioned already, uh, the uh, access to advanced cancer diagnostics and treatment as mentioned, drug repurposing, uh, and uh, the Cancer Survivor Smart Card. There was also launched four joint actions with member states uh, to prepare work on the comprehensive cancer infrastructures, the networks of expertise, as well as HPV vaccination and the rollout of e-health and telemonitoring services. Next slide. Um, this is just for information. If you want to follow up on the projects here, you have the link, next slide. Um, also to note that in Ireland, you have a national focal point that can help you if you're interested in applying for these programs. Um, this is the information on these colleagues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, similar, you also have it for Arise in Europe, and there's also a newsletter. Next slide. Uh, and next slide, which brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, if you want to have general information, uh, you can also have a look at the Europa, Europa website, DG Sante, DG RTD, and the Joint Research Center's website, and perhaps to flag also the final conference of the IPAC joint action, which will take place on the 13th and 14th of December. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. And just to let everybody know that this uh, session has been recorded and will be available on the IIA we I website. I know Matthias went through some of the slides and the links pretty quickly, but they'll all be available to you after the session to go back and, and look and, 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 and link in when you have time. I'm delighted now to introduce our second speaker. Our second speaker is um, from Janssen, which is the pharmaceutical end of um, Johnson & Johnson, Anouk de Perret. Anouk is currently leads the EMEA Government Affairs and Policy Team for Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Anouk is responsible for managing the implementation of advanced purchase agreements in, in EMEA 
of Janssen's COVID-19 vaccine. She's involved in several industry platforms to support a strong climate of biopharmaceutical innovation. Throughout her 22-year 22, 22 career in the pharmaceutical industry, Ms. Ray has been involved in initiatives to accelerate European market authorization procedures, both at the EU Commission and with the European Federation of the Pharmaceutical Industry. So Anouk, we're delighted that you're with us this afternoon and over to you. Thank you, Terence. Thank you very much. And, and let me maybe start with, with a quote that you made, Terence. 3.5 million newly diagnosed cases of cancer per year in Europe. I mean, that is just too much, right? We, we really need to work towards bringing that down. And we have made progress already, I would say, in the last 25 years, because even if incidence for cancer has went up, we have been able to bring down mortality. And we can really say that innovation in diagnostics, screening, and treatment is what has resulted in better patient outcomes. So there's definitely hope for cancer patients and for all of us, because one out of three of us will at some point we be confronted, unfortunately, with cancer. However, you know, we will not stop also as a pharmaceutical industry until we find cures for cancer. And that is really the vision that we all need to have. We bring, need to bring cancer to an end, intercept it early, because at early stage, the disease is less complex, less resistant to therapy, patients are healthier, and therefore the benefits will also be higher. We need to get the right treatment at the right time to the patients. Of course, we need to keep sustainability of healthcare systems also into account and find the right solutions for that. Now, bringing it a bit closer to the, the topic here with the European Beating Cancer Plan, I think we will now start a period where for the first time, also European policy will have a bigger impact and on how national governments organize their care. And in this case, their cancer care. Matthias, you referred to it already that the pandemic has learned us that European collaboration can make us stronger and more connected. And, and I've been involved indeed in our vaccine discussion. So I've been experiencing that firsthand. And I think without European collaboration, we would not have been in Europe with vaccinations where we are today. So we really need to learn from that. So we will see these European policies from both the European uh, Cancer Plan, but also the European Pharmaceutical Strategy, really reaching national government policies. And this is really an opportunity because we can help, it can help to drive towards better patient outcomes on one hand. On the other hand, we need to make sure that we strengthen Europe as an innovation hub for healthcare also going forward. So I would say that the European Beating Cancer Plan will be successful if the policies are also leading to action and implementation in the member states, but also if it can help to bring expertise and resources across the union, and in particular also to areas that might be with less capacity today. Now, let me zoom in for a moment into Ireland. And, and I understand from my colleagues uh, based in Ireland that Ireland has done a lot when it comes down to cancer care. The national strategy, the cancer program from 2006, these are really best practices within the European Union. Ireland also led the EU smoking sensation plan. Uh, you were the first one to ban indoor smoking, which I think we're all very happy with. And it has had an impact. Uh, the the five-year survival rates have improved for most cancers also in Ireland. Two out of three diagnosed with cancer will survive at least five years. Furthermore, Ireland is still also a, a tiger when it comes into global um, biopharmaceutical hub, uh, being a biopharmaceutical hub. A lot of companies manufacture in Ireland life-saving biologicals, including for cancer. And, and my company in Cork is, is also developing there one of our most complex biological treatments for cancer. So I would say Ireland has the foundation to lead the way and really help Europe to implement this cancer plan quickly and fast. So 
these are all positive signals, I would say, but I mean, I would also want to give a perspective on some of the challenges that are still ahead and that are holding us back in, in making progress in, on cancer care in Ireland. I would like to highlight three areas in particular. First of all, I understand that there is still a quite lack of good quality usable data for cancer care, which is one of the pillars as Matthias described in the plan. So really an opportunity to work on that. Secondly, it is also a reality that in Ireland, there is lower access to the newest treatments for cancer than in other countries. And again, I think we need to collectively work on improving that. And lastly, there is relatively low activity in research and clinical trials for cancer in Ireland. So these three areas can definitely be improved if the European Beating Cancer Plan is rapidly implemented. And maybe let me zoom in in three particular areas of the plan and that link actually with these. And Matthias already gave us a nice description of them, but really, you know, the building of data infrastructure and, and looking at how we can share data across borders, looking at interoperability, helping to build the European health data space will be critical. Investment into screening, diagnostics and biomarker testing, there's a big opportunity here, also leveraging some of the European recovery funds that the different countries will be getting, because this is really in scope of improving healthcare across the region. And then the last uh, example, and, and again, Matthias referred to it, the, the cancer uh, registry on inequalities, again, will, will help to give more visibility and benchmark data on where the different member states stand in comparison to each other with access to treatment and, and treatment care so that we can drive towards the best possible outcome and excellence in access across borders. So I think to conclude, to make the plan successful, we have to partner and we might look at it from different angles and we need to be aware about that. But at the end of the day, industry, government and the cancer care community, the cancer community, we all have a benefit in making sure that we can rapidly build and implement the initiatives in the cancer plan and really um, bring these policy recommendations into practice. So that's you know, uh, what I would like to bring as an introductory remark, and I look forward to further discussing these points in the debate. Thank you, Anouk. Uh, that was great. Um, we're going to move on to our third speaker. Um, John Crown is professor and consultant medical oncologist at St. Vincent's University Hospital. John received his medical training at University College Dublin and the State University of New York and completed his fellowship training in oncology at the Mount Sinai Medical Center and in hematology oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center before joining St. Vincent's Hospital in 1993. Uh, we'll also remember John as a passionate member of our upper house, the Senate. Um, but John uh, joins us today to talk about uh, cancer and oncology and we're very glad to see you, John. Over to you. You're on mute, John. There we go. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Terence. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Institute for the opportunity to address this important seminar. It's no secret that I'm a very committed and long-standing Europhile and specific supporter of the EU and a, a great believer that it has been an organization that has been powerfully, powerfully uh, positive in helping our country to develop. The EU's beating cancer document, I think, is full, replete with excellent goals. I think it is a, a very well stated summary of, of what the status of the problem is at the moment and how we can address it in the future. It is, as, as is the nature of these documents, and I say this not critically, a little aspirational, and it's, it's hard sometimes to go into a lot of the specifics when you're talking about a number of different jurisdictions, but I think it will give us a good framework for developing a lot of these specifics. And, you know, aspiration is good. In the, in the words of attributed to two different Irishmen, one George Bernard Shaw and one Irish American Robert Kennedy, um, some people see things as they are and say, why? Others dream of things that never were and say, why not? So we should look at things that never were and say, why not? Why can't Europe have a, a much better cancer treatment, prevention, early diagnosis and support system than it has at the moment? Um, I really believe that the flagship of public policy going forward needs to be prevention. And I'm delighted to see that the document is, is very eloquently outlined by Matthias, put such an emphasis on this. 
Um, if you look at it, the single biggest thing that made the biggest difference to cancer in general was the recognition that cutting down tobacco consumption would decrease the incidence of what is now the, the, the leading cause of cancer death worldwide, lung cancer. This was an extraordinary advance. We do see sad cases where lung cancer occurs in people who have never smoked. But in general, if we were going to do just one thing, just one thing to save the greatest number of lives uh, from cancer, we would eliminate tobacco smoking. And that's why the, the document has a, an appropriate emphasis on tightening regulation on the, uh, on, on the industry and also on education. It, it is my sincere doubt that we need to say this openly. We have one ambition for the tobacco industry and that's bankruptcy. It's the only thing we wish them to do is to go out of business. This is a, an evil industry. This is an industry whose business model is based on a very simple uh, uh, strategy, which is addict children to carcinogens. We should have nothing to do with them. They're not our partners in any area of public policy. And it should be a goal that we would aim towards criminalizing any commerce in tobacco, I believe, within an appropriate time frame, perhaps 10 to 15 years. Uh, there is simply no way that if this product was discovered tomorrow, it would be legal. It would never be approved. And um, alcohol will present a challenge. The, there is clear evidence that uh, abuse of alcohol and excess alcohol consumption uh, is bad in terms of increasing cancer risks. And as a society, we in Ireland will have certain challenges doing this, both in terms of our culture and also due to the strength of the alcohol industry. The one that has me particularly intrigued uh, is the, the goal to try and move more towards a plant-based diet. Um, understanding, as we all do, the power that the, uh, the, the agricultural industry has had on EU policy over the years. And if you'll pardon the awful pun, it'll be interesting to see them locking horns uh, with the cattle industry uh, in the years to come to see how we will actually try to move more towards a plant-based diet. But these are all very worthy goals. And, and honestly, this is where the biggest bang for the buck, I believe, at public policy level will come in prevention. Early diagnosis is critically important, and it's very uneven across Europe, and it's not particularly good in Ireland. Uh, we all think of early diagnosis as being screening, and for some cancer, screening is critically important. For some other cancers, it's well established, but has a little less impact. And for some cancers, it has little, if any, impact, uh, and there simply is no good proven screening technology for some cancers. Um, to summarize what we've done with screening, screening for pre-cancerous changes in the cervix has been an extraordinarily successful human undertaking. In countries that have widespread screening strategies, the uh, chance of dying of cervical cancer has dropped very, very dramatically. And it has to be said, after a few years of very bad press about the Irish system, most of which was wholly unjustified, cervical screening in Ireland is very good. The actual metrics, the outcome, the error rates, all of these things rank amongst the best in the world. We have a, a screening system that we should be proud of. It has saved many lives. We need to take our hats off to those visionaries who brought it into place. Breast screening is harder because the technology isn't quite as good, even in the very best run screening systems. And ours truly is one of the best. It's passed incredible international audits and at a very high level, uh, the impact of breast screening is somewhat, somewhat lower. But we have to remember that early diagnosis is not just screening. What is this? What do we have in place for the patient who develops a troubling symptom for the person who has a problem who presents to their GP? It's desperately slow in Ireland. We have put a, a number of high profile rapid access clinics in place. But I can tell you for a variety of reasons, I've occasion to review a lot of cases. There is a lot of late diagnosis of cancer in Ireland, often not because anyone made a mistake, but because the system is so slow, so sclerotic, so, so understaffed and so badly resourced. We have a very, very small number of radiologists and a very small number of scanner, scanning machines. As a result, we have extraordinary waits for these things. There's a very interesting and I, I think understandable uh, modern approach to new technology in this document, and I'd like to compliment uh, uh, Matthias and his colleagues for this. We'll focus in on two areas in particular, um, new diagnostic technology. There is no doubt that we are seeing a revolution in diagnostic technology, which is not necessarily good news for the career structure of some of the doctors who choose to make futures for themselves in radiology and pathology, because there is incredible capacity for technology and for automation in these, in these areas. We will always need skilled people to take responsibility for the results, but we will see incredible standardization, I believe, of radiology and pathology services in the future. I just hope that in Ireland we'll be in a good position to capitalize on them because we have not done well in terms of uh, deploying the older technologies which are having such great impact in other countries. And of course, the whole area of information technology, um, it, it is a very laudable goal uh, of the document to try and bring in compatible systems across Europe for a smooth transfer of patient information, research information, safety information, et cetera. 
and I think it will be apparent to any of the, the Irish participants in this meeting who've been following the newspapers this year, that the information systems that are run host systems were found to be very, very, very deficient indeed, as outlined by the, the um, cyber attack. What about access to care? This has been a real problem. The uh, document stresses the need for a European network of comprehensive cancer centers. Now, I can tell you, when I came back to Ireland in 1993, uh, I started pushing hard for this. I reckon that we needed to develop a small number of comprehensive cancer centers in Ireland. I'm afraid that, that argument did not win. And instead we got the somewhat improved, but still it has to be said, somewhat bizarre patchwork of structures that emerged from the national cancer strategies of the first decade of this century where the idea in the end was rather than trying to tackle the big hospital, big medical school politics, which would have allowed the development of a small number of rational cancer centers. Instead, what happened was a decision was made to make Dublin Inc. as one comprehensive cancer center with its resources deployed across five or six different uh, sites. This was not a good idea. I believe it's a, it's a, a nettle which should have been grasped at the time and it'll be hard to fix at this stage. Um, paradoxically, I, I shouldn't say paradoxically, it may work better in places like Cork and Galway, um, where I, I think you will find a concentration of cancer treatment, prevention, medical, nursing, radiation, support, supportive care, psychiatry resources under roof, which is under one roof, which is really what we need. I'm glad to hear, um, unsurprisingly, the industry pointing out that there's a problem with access to new drugs. Uh, there is a problem with access to new drugs. Uh, Ireland has become one of the more restrictive environments for the approval and reimbursement of new drugs and for the benefit of the uninitiated the approval of new drugs takes place at european level individual decisions about whether the drugs will be made available are made by health technology assessments by health economists in the uh, constituent countries and in ireland we've developed an additional step that even if a drug passed the health technology assessment which is run by the national center for pharmacoeconomics the hsc then has a veto right over whether it can decide it will afford it or not I, for one, have been very disappointed for the first time, for the first time in my career in Ireland in the last two years, we've seen a widening gap between the availability of drugs for public and private patients because the insurers, and I'm going to, I don't use the word private insurance, the VHI is not a private insurer, the VHI is actually social insurance, the VHI is somewhat similar to what the Canadians have, only they don't call it private insurance, they call it social insurance, it's somewhat similar to what the Germans have uh, with their social insurance. The VHI have to their credit approved for reimbursement a number of drugs and a number of indications where both the public system and the other private insurers uh, have said no. Um, we need to fix that. Um, there is a substantial problem with clinical trials. I tried addressing it many years ago and I found that the Irish Cooperative Oncology Research Group, but if I may blow my own trumpet for a second, there was a time more than a decade ago when Ireland actually was really punching way above its weight and we were uh, there was one year when we were putting a higher percentage of Irish breast cancer patients on trials than any other country in Europe is doing. And I'm just a little bit sad to see how that, that whole thing has unraveled to an extent in recent years, but hopefully there have been some new moves by the HRB, which hopefully will readdress it. Finally, they say, oh, we say finally in the talk, it gives the audience hope. But finally, I think Brexit gives us an intellectual opportunity. I think we need to, as we wave goodbye to our departing British colleagues, and friends who have made, I believe, a historic mistake. Uh, I believe we also need to say goodbye to the notion which has taken a deep grip on certain aspects of the Irish political sphere, that we should try and emulate the 1947-1948 health service, which was designed by an Iron Dove in the British NHS. Uh, and that's what is, uh, was being attempted with Schlontecare. Uh, I believe Schlontecare will enshrine to to care. I believe it addresses none of the core problems of the Irish health system, which are uh, inefficiency, inequality and generally mediocre quality and I, i'm sorry to say mediocre quality i know it sounds provocative it's not that the nurses and doctors aren't good but if you have to wait six months to see them it doesn't matter how good they are that's rotten care so thank you to the eu for your support over the years thank you for lighting away which i hope will shine a bit of a light to deficiencies in our health system i do hope we have some visionary people domestically who will look at these understand the problems we have and try and fix some of the problems thank you very much thank you john um, and now last but not least, um, our fourth speaker is Rachel Morrill. Rachel is Director of Advocacy and External Relations of the Irish Cancer Society since April 2020 and previously served as the Head of Advocacy Department from 18 to 2020. She's an experienced campaigner with extensive advocacy and policy experience having worked in the Oireachtas with large multinationals in public affairs consultancy and the non-profit sector for more than 15 years. And we're very glad to see you, Rachel, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, hello to everyone who's joined the discussion today. 
I'm delighted to have been asked to participate um, and extend like my colleagues um, particular thanks to the IIEA for organising um, and to Janssen for sponsoring such an important conversation about um, cancer care. To begin, um, I want to start with the most important aspect of cancer care and that of course is patients. Um, for those of you who are in Ireland and reading the newspapers today, we're reeling off eye-watering numbers and waiting lists and we speak of time bombs and tidal waves. Um, and it's important to reflect, I think, that aggregating the many challenges facing patients into headlines designed to motivate political action ignores the tragedy that it is our families and our friends, our neighbours and our colleagues, people who are loved and who are needed, who are experiencing the day-to-day -day realities that having cancer brings. And these day-to-day -day realities, they're manifested in waiting times and other barriers to care that John spoke about. They're being borne by patients over many years, and certainly COVID has had a profound effect on the health services' ability to deliver cancer care. But in our case, in Ireland, there were system level vulnerabilities that had been allowed to grow with inadequate investment, insufficient capacity, too few healthcare professionals and limited resources. So when the pandemic hit, it was layered on top of a system that couldn't cope with existing predictable demand and the, the scale of the challenge grew and grew. And thankfully the Beating Cancer Plan was already a key priority of the von der Leyen Commission before COVID, although its publica publication was delayed while the impact of the pandemic grew. But alongside these delays, the need for the pan-European plan was becoming more and more urgent given the severe disruption in cancer tests, cancer screening, um, and cancer treatment right across the EU. And as our national government struggled to cope with the significant pressures in the health service, the, the pre-COVID cracks that I described there, they, they became chasms. Um, and in Ireland, we estimate that there were approximately 10% fewer cancers picked up in 2020 compared to 2019, although the official figures haven't been published yet. And across Europe, around 100 million cancer screenings did not take place. So in June, the Irish Cancer Society told the Oireachtas Health Committee that now is the time to revolutionise the way cancer care is delivered in Ireland, because these delays, the uncertainties, and um, the cancellations and interruptions, again, in the news again today, they've all had a really serious effect um, on cancer patients and their families, not just because of the, the clinical implications, um, but on mental health. Patients, when they're calling our, our support line every day of the week, they're, they're feeling significant anxiety, increased distress, and the impact of that will be felt for many years to come. And the impact of COVID on medical teams as well to deliver non-COVID care. I know um, MEPs heard testimony from an Irish oncologist earlier this year that during the pandemic, he had stood beside someone's bed and prayed for a negative COVID swab so that a patient could die with unrestricted family visiting. He had told a patient that she was dying when he was dressed in full PPE and she had no family present. And he called patients to delay life-saving treatment because of COVID issues. And that is happening today. And that is the trauma caused by COVID. Um, and it's that environment into which the, the Beating Cancer Plan was published. Um, and it's why it's even more important than ever before. Um, because not only has the pandemic negatively affected the delivery and access to cancer services and medical care, um, which are in the competency of, of the national governments. But it also caused, like John said, significant challenges with, with critical research, innovation, disease prevention, the digital transformation. I mean, the cyber attack in the middle of all of this is incredible. Um, and the sustainability of health systems themselves, which are areas that the EU can complement national policies. Um, and I think there's, there's many reasons to be optimistic. Um, and the Beating Cancer Plan leverages like a fundamental observation that all of us will, will have had um, over the last 19 months. And that's that COVID doesn't respect borders. And of course, cancer doesn't either. And that's why we as, as Europeans must work together um, and implement this visionary policy so that it's felt by cancer patients in every member state. Um, because although COVID is a disease that kept us all apart, we, we need to now come together um, and we need to build back a better response to cancer than was in place before. That's going to be challenging and John's touched on some of the challenges and so is Anouk, but member states, we're all starting off on different points in terms of um, our own national health strategies. And it's at that national health service level um, that medical care are defined and delivered. 
that, that there's a lot that the Beating Cancer Plan can do to complement um, our national health, health systems. Um, the, the Beating Cancer Plan is very aligned to our own national cancer plan. Um, it has a significantly bigger budget, um, which, which is good. Um, and that it's already advancing, um, like Matea said, um, initiatives across all the, the pillars of the plan already. Um, and some of those are going to happen in 2021 are the Knowledge Centre on Cancer, initiatives to improve the early detection and treatment of cancer um, through the European Cancer Imaging Initiative and um, improving e-health, um, among other things. But again, John touched on cyber attack. And I think that anybody who has observed health service delivery over the last number of years will know that Ireland, um, we're not exactly a leader um, in e-health solutions. And in fact, um, a report that was published at the end of last year was very tantalizingly called deploying data-driven intelligence to measure um, the impact of COVID-19 on cancer care and cancer patients, um, concluded more disappointingly than the title revealed um, that there were considerable data constraints in preparing that report. And it, it pointed out that Ireland does not currently have a connected health data intelligence system, that without innovative e-health solutions, there's no access to high quality data and that the e-health strategy for Ireland which was published I think in 2013 needs to be fully implemented and that's just an example um, but there are some elements of the beating cancer plan that may face some practical barriers when it reaches the point of implementation at member state level and another example is the, um, the commission will soon set in motion an interspeciality cancer training program um, and the hope is that it's going to be an effective way to deliver more skilled um, and mobile um, cancer workforce through cross-border training um, and information sharing. But how do we ensure that more fundamentally we recruit and retain highly skilled cancer clinicians in Ireland when one in five consultant posts are unfilled um, for reasons relating to, to working conditions and pay? Um, and lastly, and it's mentioned before as well, is the, um, uh, the, the comprehensive cancer centres. And despite some progress being made by individual cancer hospitals and their linked universities, um, we, we were looking at the, um, the implementation plan for the National Cancer Strategy. And by the end of 2020, the Department of Health and the National Cancer Control Programme had only got to the stage of considering the steps required towards the establishment of a comprehensive cancer centre. And yet before the end of the year, the commission will work to set up a network of comprehensive cancer centres, which it says um, is going to be a flagship that will make a significant difference to the quality of care and address inequality. So if we don't have the comprehensive cancer centre, does that mean that Irish patients and clinicians are going to miss out because this aspect of the, the cancer strategy has not yet been advanced? I'm gonna finish on the positive and um, because there, there are so many, um, when considering this, this first step, which has been described as um, a, a true European health union. Um, there's so much motivation and um, belief, commitment um, and, and energy surrounding the Beating Cancer Plan. In talking to, to people in preparation for this discussion, like I could feel it, um, it's, it's electric and it's very motivating. Um, I imagine we're on the start of a very long journey, um, but the, the, the message is that we're moving. Um, and the next step, like everyone has said, is implementation, and, and that, will be, that will be the tricky part. So we need strong KPIs, we need clear targets, um, lots of experts and financial support, and with the, the committed and resolute leadership at EU and, and member state level, I believe we can do it, and I believe we must do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And now just remind people again that if you want to put questions to the panel or any individual members of the panel, please use the Q&A function on, on the Zoom. Uh, might start in the whole area just of, of the how the 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 plan is will impact what do you think how would how will it impact um cancer services in ireland and we, a number of you dealt with that issue as well so maybe we might just start off by asking you this especially rachel asked some questions there whether that whether anuk or john or matthias wants to address some of the questions uh of of how the plan can be uh, can best affect ireland and help us propel forward um, what are the easy wins here? What are the more difficult areas? And what can we do about those? So, other whether Myas, Anouk, or John, maybe Anouk, I might just start with you just on that issue of just what you've heard today. Any other further reflections? Yeah, no, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Terence, for that. Well, yeah, I think I, I, I highlighted top line already a couple of things, but I think one that we really should um, win on is getting to better data for cancer care. Uh, I think, again, the pandemic has, has shown the power of real-time data generation, um, but also its limitations and, and you know, interoperability and, and standardizing data is something for as long as I have been in European policy has been around as something we have to fix. 
I think now with this plan, but also with the European Health Data Space Initiative and, and legislative proposal that will be put forward by the European Commission, we have the opportunity to really make this happen. Um, I, I hear from my colleagues in Ireland that in Ireland you don't have European uh, um, electronic health records yet, eh? but plan to build some. So I think if, if Ireland builds this now, you should really take this cross-border sharing and interoperability into account during the conception phase. <laughs> it's maybe an advantage that nothing is built yet because you can build it in the right way. Um, and maybe also look at, at how other countries have done this. I mean, I know that in, in Finland, there's a fantastic example, but also in France. So those best practice sharing could really help to build better data for cancer care. And then maybe if I may, second area I would want to highlight that we touched upon during our introductory speeches, all of us, is the early screening and diagnostics. Um, I mean, what the EU did, I, I can't remember when that the council recommendations on, on breast, cervical and uh, uh, colorectal cancer were put in place, but this was already an amazing step forward. I mean, all of us in most countries do get access to this. And, and I know you want to bring it up to 90% of the population that should be eligible to get access. And that's really a clear target. So let's work to that but also adding other cancers and, and the work to generate evidence that it makes sense to add more cancers such as lung cancer, gastric cancer, pancreas cancer. We need the data and the evidence that it makes sense, but I, I think we, we should really prioritize that as well. And then maybe lastly, the innovative uh, aspects of, of biomarker tests and, and getting towards tests and screenings that can cover more cancers in one go through to blood testing, that their investment of, of the funds into public-private collaborations to achieve that would be very important. So maybe I'll, you know, might be other things, but I'll, I'll stop there to, to give time to the others. I'm gonna to go to John next, but Matthias, I've got quite a few questions to you, so I'm not, not leaving you out, but I'll just go to John next for his, his uh, uh, any reflections about the racial, the issue the racial is finding out from the front line. You're on mute, John. Sorry. In terms of what we think it will do to achieve change in Ireland, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I must admit, I've kind of made a separate piece at this stage. I devoted a big chunk of my youth and middle age to really aggressive attempts to reform the Irish health system up to it, including running and advocating in the Shannon for it. I've kind of given up at this stage. So I think we should aim for what's doable with this. I think what will approximately 40 million, what can we do with Ireland and what lessons can we learn? I don't think we'll get comprehensive cancer centers from it. Hopefully it will at least recreate the debate around the need for comprehensive cancer centers. I don't think it'll fix the health service. I would have thought that the big bang for the buck in this would be in the IT, uh, both in the new diagnostic IT and also in the, um, in the as, as has been outlined a few moments ago, but in the medical records. Uh, I, I think there's a real opportunity. That kind of money I think could make a difference in that regard. And, it, and it's very primitive at the moment. Uh, and it will, there'll be a multiplier effect. Making an investment in it now will enable us to make better value and to take advantage of other new technologies that will come in the future. But if we don't have the platforms right in the first place, uh, we won't be able to do it. And I think we should really, really bone up our efforts on prevention. Uh, I think we really need to tackle, you know, being obese is now unfortunately becoming a nearly as big a risk factor, if not a bigger risk factor for cancer than smoking is. As smoking declines, obesity is becoming a major problem in Ireland. And we really have to tackle that problem too, because it would be one thing which we could do, which would greatly reduce the incidence of cancers. Thank you, John. Um, Matthias, then just going to with some of these specific issues in, in, the, in the plan that people are asking about. Eileen Hickey, who is a patient living in cancer, asked two, two questions. One, can you just explain further about the Cancer Survivor Smart Card and its use? And then also maybe uh, say whether there's any proposed cancer patient involvement in the plan as well. So those two, two questions are. Yes, um, well, perhaps with the Smart Card, um, there has been already EU projects um, preparing or, or considering a Smart Card setup. And the idea behind the Smart Card is essentially that uh, patients have access to their data, uh, can make this data available um, for research, for instance. It can be used for the follow-up care um, after, after treatment, etc. So 
um, that this information, patient information is portable, patients have direct access to it, can take it to other treatment centers, to other professionals to get a second opinion, et cetera. So this is one of the ideas for the smart card that's linking also to the uh, patient digital center with the view that patients, of course, voluntarily can make available their data, can pool it, and this can be used then also for research purposes, for instance. Um, the second involvement of patients in the, in the cancer plan, um, first of all, we had a very wide public consultation in the preparation of the plan uh, on which we got 2,400 responses, um, including from patient organizations. Um, secondly, uh, we had the patient clearly in mind and our commissioner herself as a cancer survivor made sure that this is the case when drafting the plan. And thirdly, as part of the uh, stakeholder contact group, uh, this is also a way for us to engage with patients, of course, with all stakeholders, but a special place we have there for patients. Thank you, Matthias. I might just follow on with a question which I'll direct first to you, but the rest of the panel may come in as well. Um, this is from uh, Liz Yates, who's the CEO of the Mari Keating Foundation. And she asked, um, can you advise what other cancer types are being considered for the expanded cancer screening scheme? So what other cancers should we be trying to screen at an earlier stage? Very absolutely outstanding one is lung cancer. There are incredible data have emerged over the last two years for screening for lung cancer. Screening women with a smoking history for lung cancer will save far more lives of women than screening all women in the appropriate age groups with mammography for breast cancer. The impact is very, very large. And boy, will it be difficult to do in Ireland. We have such a, I mean, I'm sorry for sounding like a broken record, but I mean, we now have a waiting list to get on the waiting list for scans in some of our hospitals. Uh, we have just appalling waiting times for CT scans and, and screening for lung cancer involves a series of CT scans delivered over a number of years. But this is incredibly powerful in terms of its potential for reducing mortality. The data for that are very, very strong. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to echo what Professor Crown said there around lung cancer screening. Um, I think that it's really important that Ireland takes a leadership position. There are trials and pilots that have taken place um, over in the UK and they've been proved to be very successful. And I know that um, the Irish MEP Deirdre Clune has put down an amendment um, to the beating pan cancer plan that includes lung cancer screening. Um, and I think we should all get behind that. Thanks, Rachel. I don't know whether Matthias, do you have anything to say on cancer, other cancer types between screening? Uh, yes, um, uh, perhaps just to mention that we are already working on that. So there is uh, a strategic um, or scientific advice mechanism at EU level. So there's a group of chief scientific advisors um, that uh, report directly to the president, uh, and they have a mandate to actually look into this matter. Um, uh, and they have already organized a couple of workshops and they will present uh, their opinion by the end of February. Secondly, uh, also in preparation of the uh, proposal to update the council recommendation, we will soon be launching a call for evidence. So this is another public consultation by the commission uh, where we invite also feedback. Now to, uh, concerning the question in the cancer plan, we have explicitly mentioned three cancer types, uh, prostate, lung, and gastric cancer, um, where we certainly will review the evidence whether this is sufficient to suggest population-based screening. Uh, but the mandate for the scientific advice mechanism is broader than that. So they will also look at other cancer types that could be potentially considered. Anouk, anything on um, screening from your perspective? Well, I, I would also agree that it's important we look at other cancers and, and, and lung cancer in particular, but also find, find screening techniques that can detect maybe the disease at an early, earlier stage before it's already at a stage where maybe therapeutic intervention is, is more complicated. Yeah. Thank you. Um, again, the question of Matthias, as is from Harriet Duke with the Public Policy Manager with Merck. She's asking, um, are there any work streams or funding opportunities that Ireland can access under the plan to support efforts to improve how we collect and use cancer data? So work streams or funding opportunities to help us improve the data collection. We've all been talking about data, but are there any specific things that we can leverage from the, from the EU uh, initiatives? Um, well, I think one, one of the core initiatives uh, has already been mentioned, the European Health Data Space. Um, 
uh, and the proposal that's currently under preparation. Um, perhaps also to flag that we are now working very closely with the joint research centers, uh, which provide the secretariat to the European network of cancer registries. Uh, and we also intend to make um, additional support available to the registries to ensure that we can have better data coverage and more timely data coverage. Um, there is no call in 2021, um, but, uh, and I cannot prejudge what comes out in 2022, um, but it's clearly our intention to support um, this element because it has been very clearly identified as a key issue to be addressed at the EU level. Okay, um, might move on to another question then. Anybody wants to come into that? Um, Thorsten Giesecke, who's the general manager of Janssen in Ireland, um, says COVID-19 has taught us that huge challenges can be solved by partnering collaboration. In order to initiate a comprehensive collaboration to beat cancer in Ireland, what other partners or stakeholders need to be included in that? So the partnership and collaboration, who else do we need to involve in this uh, battle? Uh, John or uh, Rachel, do you want to start with that? I'd say, Terence, that everybody needs a seat at the table um, when it comes to um, the beating cancer plan um, and the kind of the national level um, health systems as well. I think that um, in this cancer strategy, there is a, a patient panel that's part of the Department of Health. And I think that that's contributed greatly to the input of patients um, into the kind of the policy level work that's being done. Um, I, I also think that there's a role for, um, I think it was Anuki mentioned, kind of the public-private partnerships as well. I think that that can accelerate progress. Um, and I think we looked, need to look more deeply at that. Uh, John, anything on other people we need to uh, partner with? Uh, just briefly, I, I would just say that I, I think we need to have a, a fundamental re-education of the people who actually run the health service in the Department of Health and the HSE about the problems on the ground. I, I, I just think that... I think they're you know, fighting the wrong war right now, and they're fighting a war against the professionals who work in their system and not actually seeing the need to actually fix the, fix, this, fix the system and that the actual correction of the deficiencies in the system may involve some diminution in the power that the people in central office have. Uh, I really believe that, and I, that can only happen politically. So uh, I guess you understand why I'm not optimistic about big improvements, certainly in healthcare reform. The thing which would make the biggest difference to fixing cancer care in Ireland is fixing the health service. Maybe Terence, just if I can add one perspective from my side, I mean, I, I think during the pandemic, we saw bubbles of innovation of partnerships. And, and I mean, just looking at one example of, of Italy, where my, my colleagues in Italy were directly involved, they, they set up a, a telemedicine, get your medicine, Janssen medicine at home project in collaboration with the medical society and with the government in a matter of weeks. And, and you know those type of innovations that we were able to do during the pandemic because there was a crisis and a need that trust that that we've built we should try to keep that going forward and I don't know one idea could be that you know in the member states we have little uh, teams that look at the implementation of the plan with the different partners involved and and but make it very concrete so that it doesn't become you know just talking to each other and nothing happens but where we can really look at the initiatives and see okay how can we build these together each from our angle um, I really hope that you know the kind of collaborations that were sp spurred during the pandemic can continue uh, because that would be at least something positive coming out of COVID. Okay, and Matthias, anything near end in terms of other people to be drawn into partnership collaboration space? Um, yes, perhaps two points. First, um, just, just to be clear that the stakeholder contact group is open to all uh, stakeholders, so uh, not, not only to patients, but also to health professionals, to, uh, to industry, etc. So we want to be as inclusive and collaborative as possible. Um, and then perhaps uh, to referring to what Anuk said, um, teams to help or look at the implementation at national level. Um, perhaps just to flag that in Belgium, um, they are now setting up a mirror group, basically, um, of what's happening at EU level, at national level. So they try to bring together all the stakeholders, all the relevant political uh, players, uh, departments, uh, as one group to replicate basically what we have at EU level in terms of governance and see how they can best implement um, the uh, Europe's Beating Cancer Plan at national level. 
And uh, this could perhaps be a blueprint for other countries to follow uh, to ensure that implementation does happen and that it's collaboratively as much as possible. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, it was a question that just uh, sparked by a couple of comments from Anouk and Mary Rachel on the impact of COVID and the, on the whole area of cancer care and treatment. Um, you talked about the difficulties, that just the huge uh, frustration that brought as well to the, the whole area. But you see any, Anouk talked about some innovations, the good practices. Are there any good practices we've seen during COVID that we want to try and capture and, and better structure into the, into the treatment here, Rachel or John? Um, I, I, I'm sorry enough, I'm sounding like Banquo's ghoster, but I, 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 I wasn't quite as impressed with how things went with COVID. I think there were really, really heroic efforts by incredibly brave young nurses, mostly young doctors. Thankfully, people my age group weren't in the front line. They did a huge job and we really saw the motivation and the selflessness which was in the system. But to me, the big lesson is the deficiencies which were there to start off with and how easily they were unmasked. Now, thank God, tragedies with COVID, awful lives lost, lives cut short, bereavements, terrible. It could have been so much worse. This was a disease which had two closely related diseases, SARS and MERS, which each had a much higher mortality. Imagine if we had had a disease with a 10% mortality hit Ireland with our number of intensive care units. We heard frightening figures today that one third of the intensive care unit beds in Ireland are occupied by COVID patients. That is worrying and it's troubling troubling not for two reasons. Number one, that there are still sick COVID patients, but troubling that we have so few ICU beds still that run the bottom of the scale. Well, why do we have to prop up the bottom of the scale of every resource, every person power resource, uh, and every actual physical resource in the OECD? What, why is it that we're always at the bottom of those scales? And I really, it has to be remembered that the reason we coped with COVID, and, and COVID was a stress that the best health systems in the world would creak under. The Germans did very well early on with COVID and they creaked when they got a, a bigger surge later. This was an unprecedented event in modern medicine. So I, I wouldn't judge a system harshly for not doing well with it. But the reason we coped well was we closed pretty much everything else down. That's the reason why we did. It wasn't that we were so wonderful. It's that all kinds of other areas just ceased to exist for months at a time while, while we dealt with COVID. So I think the main lesson from COVID is we weren't ready. Let's be ready the next time. Let's have resilience. Let's have, we do need a little redundancy in the health system. You know, the idea that everything works at 105% may make the health economists really happy that you know we really have things down to a huge level of efficiency, but it's not a humane way to run a health system. And just observe that the supply chain uh, is also needs a bit of redundancy built into it as well as we're also finding out. Uh, just go to, to Rachel and then back to a new commentaries. Rachel, anything else from COVID? Yeah, I just, yeah, I I I would agree with John that um you know there were challenges there before before COVID. Um but I think that the fact that the elective care essentially stopped um has you know has had that huge emotional toll on people as well. Like those people who have got phone calls over the last week, so very, very recently to tell them that life-saving treatment isn't going ahead or it's being postponed um, because of these pressures that John's describing on ICU. And that, it, that you know, the healthcare professionals have, I echo totally what he's saying, they've done an absolutely amazing f job over the last period of time. This isn't their fault. It's the system that's actually blocking people from getting the care they need. And one of our nurses was speaking to um, somebody who was diagnosed with bowel cancer over the last number of weeks and he was meant to be getting regular um, colonoscopies because he has a family history of bowel cancer um, and when he became symptomatic he went to his GP and he his um, his, his colonoscopy was, was accelerated and he was diagnosed with, with bowel cancer and he he will never know whether he could have had um, treatment earlier and that could actually um, have been a, a much more positive outcome for him um, and these are the kind of you know these are real people these are people who we all know um, and and it's just it's a tragedy um, and and I hope that the recovery um, over the next period of time is swift and people get the care they need. So Matthias from you and uh, the ob observing the impact of cancer or COVID on, on the on the health system any other lessons for your plan uh, that have been affected by COVID in terms of, of learnings or, or implications? 
Well, I think there are, there are a number of implications. First of all, it's it's true that we don't have real time data, so um, many member states could not basically assess what the impact of COVID on cancer care was. I mean, there of course there are now some research projects, but that would be an element where we think uh, collaboration across the EU um, could help um, get uh, member states better data and uh, more timely data. Um, secondly, I think, uh, and this is unfortunately only anecdotal evidence, there is a wealth of uh, good practice examples how, and, and An Anouk referred to that, how uh, silos were broken down, how, how new collaborations sprung up. Um, and this is indeed that we will consider at EU level how we can basically um, gather this wealth of evidence uh, and, and make it lasting and, and actually share it also across member states. I think this, if something comes out of this, um, of this pandemic, it might be that we have new practices perhaps that we can roll out and support also with our mechanisms, for instance, on best practice implementation. Terence, you're on mute, but I think- I'm on mute. <laughs> um, and just to say from your end, you did give us an example of misery. Anything, any other issues that you see arising from COVID and implications? Yes, well, maybe another example that, that we saw that impacted us directly that also clinical trials were suspended or slowing down. And, and that has also you know, a direct impact on, on innovation and the speed of future innovation. So also there, I mean, telemedicine also in clinical trials can also, can also provide solutions, but yeah, we, we have to think about all these things going forward. Um, but other than that, um, I, I would say that, you know, in my own country, Belgium, cancer diagnosis went down 30 to 40%. Um, we have data that half of the patients, their treatment was disrupted. So this will have an impact on, on their outcome. And, and I would say as a I think key lesson, well, it's maybe not a lesson, but I hope maybe, let's hope that healthcare budgets are not cut because as John, Professor Crown was saying as well, we, we stopped all the inter other interventions and that's why we were able to minimize maybe to some extent the, the drama, but we should really invest more in healthcare and austerity will not be the solution. And specifically for cancer treatment and then bringing it to Ireland, given access to the best possible treatment in Ireland is suboptimal, there we need to really bring up the healthcare budgets to a level that would allow for better access to these treatments. Okay, I want the next question, uh, unless somebody wants to uh, further that. Um, this is from Muriel O'Byrne. Uh, Muriel makes the observation that the results of the EFPIA WAIT survey are deeply worrying with, about Ireland's rate of availability of oncology therapies being less than countries such as Bulgaria, Slovenia and the Czech Republic. She says, considering our GDP as a country, this seems shameful. And she asks, does the panel have any ideas how we can tackle this so new innovations can ultimately reach patients? And I might leave you to last, John, because I think you've probably given us your initial views on this anyway. So uh, Ireland, again, to use John's earlier words, not high on the table and anything Ireland can do to, um, to make sure that new innovations get here quickly. Um, Anouk, Rachel. Well, I'm happy, happy to go first. Um, it is indeed, I mean, I know that data very well and directly involved with my team in, in, in FPI in, in helping to, to regularly update that. And, We've seen since 2012 that indeed Ireland has been lagging behind. Um, again, compared to my own countries, patients in Ireland wait three times longer than in Belgium or four and a half, half times longer than in Denmark, which is a country with similar population and, and similar national income. So I think, well, being uh, having more data on this and what are the consequences there, I think the European Beating Cancer Plan and the register that Matthias was referring to will, will give us data. Um, there are disparities in EU survival data, EU five-year survival data as well. And, and it, there is evidence that that is linked to uptake of cancer medicines. So these two are connected. But how can we improve uptake of cancer medicines? I think, as I said, I mean, we need to invest in, in cancer care financially also and, br and bring up the budget um, and then also measure outcome for cancer patients based on what matters to them and, and then calculate the cost um, based on that outcome. I think I understand in many countries today, 
the healthcare system rewards providers based on the number of patients that they treat, not necessarily the outcome that these patients are, are having. And, and that is a big shift, um, which I don't know if the society is prepared to take, but I think that would be one that could help drive to making better decisions on which treatment should which patient get at which point in time. Rachel? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with those comments. Um, I think that patients are the ones who are ultimately paying the price when they're when a you know their clinician doesn't have access to a drug that um, a patient in another country does, and I think that that's very inequitable. Um, I think that it's an area that the European Union um, has great potential, and um, that we as Europeans work collaboratively to ensure that patients in every member state um, has the same level of access. And we know that the clinicians in Ireland are, are greatly frustrated, um, certainly over recent years, um, where the, the budget for new drugs um, has, has been either low or non-existent. Um, I think in the, the budget for 2022, I think um, a number, I think 13 million um, was given to, to new drugs, but that's probably only going to clear the backlog um, rather than to fund the new, the new drugs that are needed um, by patients in Ireland. Matthias, um, issue for Ireland and, and what innovations we should be tackling to, to, uh, to get up the league. Can, can I just say something briefly on that? I mean, we, I think the main lesson from COVID was the magic money lesson. Uh, when suddenly we really needed a whole lot of money to pay people to, to keep their keep businesses alive, to keep people from starving because they couldn't go to work, to you know to buy masks and buy drugs and buy vaccines. We, for some reason, the magic the money appeared like magic. Now I don't quite understand macro macro macroeconomics, but systems that were told a few years ago that they couldn't spend seven million to vaccinate every young girl in the country with a vaccine that would stop them dying of cancer suddenly were able to pull tens of billions out of the ether. Uh, to cope with the structure. So somebody, an economist will have to teach me what that lesson is, how you find magic money, because we could certainly do some for the cancer services. Um, the uh, other issue that we really have um, is that we're, why is our drug access so poor? It's because about 15 years ago, we set up a system to emulate the way the British were approving cancer drugs. The British had the most restrictive cancer drug approval process in the developed world. They had a thing called NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which was really tremendously Orwellian name because the effect was anything but NICE. And it meant that all kinds of life-saving drugs just were routinely denied to British people, disproportionately British women with breast cancer. So the British have moved past that. They now have new structures in place for providing drugs. So they're now way ahead of us. We're now at the bottom of the rung. We're down somewhere near New Zealand in terms of poor access to cancer drugs. So why can't we have... You know, as I said earlier on, I'm a very enthusiastic European. I'm not beyond criticizing the EU. And I, I sometimes grit my teeth when I hear harmonization as a goal all of its own. The only problem that harmonization fixes is a lack of harmonization. But there's one thing that really should be harmonized. Why don't we just make a rule? If the drug is reimbursed in Germany, we do it. If we want to be like the Europeans, if we want to be, you know, we're nearly as rich as they are now in terms of GDP per head of population. If, you know, if it's approved in Belgium, if it's improved in the Netherlands and other peer countries, we should just approve it. Why do we have to go through a separate process of doing it here? And what's more, say, we'll pay for it at the rate that they've negotiated. Why don't we have a European wide, if I'm not sure if carteling is, if I'm breaking the law by suggesting a cartel, but why don't the EU countries get together and say, this is what the EU countries will pay. And if, if it's approved and if it's reimbursed, we will guarantee it to be made available equally and fairly uh, in every country. And finally, just a little editorial point on something Anouk said there about paying providers to do things. In Ireland, we pay them not to do things. We pay our hospital providers to keep people on waiting lists. That's the way you stay under budget because there is no additional money if you're more efficient and you get people off the waiting list. In Ireland, the amount of money is the same if you have a waiting list of one or a waiting list of 10 million or a waiting time of a week or a waiting time of a year. That's the problem we have in Ireland. And we need to link activity, efficiency and reimbursement. And Shalom to Care ain't gonna do that. Thank you, John. Um, Matthias, again, just coming to you in terms of things that Ireland can do um, from your perspective, best practices in other countries, uh, anything that, that we, we should be thinking about early on? Um, well, I think uh, with the cancer plan, uh, you have now the possibility for, uh, let's say, large scale 
EU collaboration in, in, in many areas that concern cancer. Uh, and I think uh, one of the specific added values of EU collaboration is that you can learn from each other. And of course, you have to be ready to, uh, let's say, implement then also best practices that uh, come from other member states. Um, I think a good sign, and I mentioned in my, my presentation, uh, four joint actions that are launched with member states. I think a positive sign is that uh, out of those four, for three, Ireland has uh, expressed interest to collaborate. So I think this is already a very good sign. I cannot provide further information because this is also un still under development, but um, Ireland is collaborating at the EU level. And I think that's, that's, that's very good. Um, on the issue perhaps of um, access to drugs, um, this, this is difficult part because obviously this is under um, the mandate of the member states and they they can decide that and it's uh, quite sensitive as has been shown by let's say the long time that was needed to get final agreement on the commission's um, proposal for health technology assessment so um, it is difficult and I think this also um, something where let's say certain advocacy needs to be done at national level, because I think at EU level, we can offer these opportunities, but we cannot force member states to take them. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, we're coming last we, we can, we can force them. We force them to do other things. We just need to make a decision that we're willing to do it. Uh, you know, European law has precedence over national law. We've heard this very eloquently outlined in the constitutional crisis in Poland. We can do it if we make it a decision that we will do it. Thank you. Um, so we're moving the last 10 or 15 minutes. So these are going to be probably um, smaller questions, or we won't get to all the questions, unfortunately. So I apologize to people who've asked questions, we'll get to them, but maybe get quick answers to these. And it's a very specific one. Given the comments on tobacco, what does Professor Crown recommend when it comes to reduced risk products like e-cigarettes and helping people move away from combustible tobacco? So any views on e-cigarettes, John? Uh, E-cigarettes are clearly far less harmful than uh, cigarettes, and they're a very useful smoking cessation tool, and we should use them and re as we're trying to get smokers to break their nicotine habit. However, it keeps the nicotine habit alive. The real worry is that many of the forces that are pushing e-cigarettes are not necessarily good actors society. A lot of them are either the drug, the, sorry, the uh, tobacco companies themselves or their surrogates, and they're pushing these because they want to increase the pool of people who will be addicted to nicotine because there is a fairly high rate of, of transfer from e-cigarettes to tobacco. So, yes, we should definitely use them to help people get off cigarettes. They're far less harmful. We're better to get them off at, at nicotine altogether, but we need to regulate them to within an inch of their life in terms of letting children take them up as a new habit. Any other comments from panel members on that? I think that if they were to be used as a cessation tool, then they'd need to be um, regulated as such. Um, and the fact that I don't think any cigarettes um, companies have actually applied to be regulated as a medicinal product um, just indicates, I suppose it reinforces some HRB research, which found that e-cigarettes weren't any more um, efficacious than the nicotine replacement therapy, which is on the market and which is, um, which is regulated. Um, so I think that we need just to be mindful of what John was saying there about the people who back e-cigarettes and um, they're owned by the, the big tobacco industry um, and that they do link to um, when children smoke e-cigarettes, there is a link to them taking up tobacco in later life. So I'd, I'd be treating them with extreme caution. I'm not sure Nick and Matthias is going left too, but I want the next question then. Um, this is from Bernard Malley, who's the Irish Pharmaceutical Healthcare Association. He asks, does the panel believe if there are risks to the development of new cancer treatments with potential changes in the way to the IP, the intellectual property and census framework in Europe? So I don't know whether, Anu, do you want to start with that one? Since you've been considering this, I'm sure. Yes, thank, thank you, Terence. So, well, absolutely, IP and intellectual property and having the right incentives in place will drive innovations to certain areas. I mean, we have seen that if you look at, at antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistance, there's no more incentives for commercial organizations, uh, or they were, I should say, no more incentives for commercial organizations to enter into the development of these. And that is needed to, to bring corporations together to do that. So I, going forward, I mean, I don't see that happen into cancer because there's also still a huge unmet medical need. And, and that's also where we wanna drive our innovations to, but definitely 
for that innovation to happen in Europe, it needs to continue to have a very strong intellectual property and incentives framework in place. So that's a um, key priority. Matthias, I don't know if you can make any observations on this. Uh, well, perhaps to refer to the um, pharmaceutical strategy that was also published um, recently and in which the commission is reviewing and uh, perhaps innovating the existing legal frameworks um, for developing innovative products. So it's been looked at. And Rachel or John, anything on that? Okay. Um, question from Kay Curtin, Melanoma Support Ireland. And again, back to something, a topic we haven't come, out, come across today yet. As a result of COVID, cancer patients were finding, already finding it difficult to acquire travel, travel insurance would find travel even more difficult. This is a particular problem in Ireland due to the costs involved. So Kay asks, what can the Beijing Cancer Plan do to remove financial barriers like this for patients? So people who can find it hard to get, acquire and, and pay for travel insurance while they're a cancer patient. Um, this, this is one of the elements that I mentioned in my, in my uh, presentation that we're looking into the issue of fair access to financial services and that includes also insurance. Um, uh, different types of insurances, um, but we are aware um, that cancer patients or cancer survivors um, have difficulties in accessing certain types of products. In the cancer plan, we have said that we will work with the relevant players and the industry to develop a code of conduct. And we will also look how in the more long run uh, we can find solutions to these issues. Rachel? Um, yeah, and I really feel for Kay, and I know that there's many cancer patients, cancer survivors who are suffering what Kay is at the moment. Um, I obviously understand what Matthias is saying about the code of conduct. I'm not sure code of conduct is what's needed. I would suggest that legislation is needed. Um, I think that there is some amendments down um, from the, the Becca committee um, that would mean that um, a, an adult cancer survivor um, wouldn't be financially penalised for 10 years post-diagnosis in a child and um, for five years post-diagnosis. Um, and it seems so unfair that people are being financially punished for actually surviving cancer um, by the, the financial services. Um, and we hope that legislation will be brought in in Ireland. Maybe we can show, I know there's three countries in Europe already have legislation in place, um, but maybe Ireland um, can be the next country which, which takes leadership in this area. We should have a bill of rights for cancer patients and cancer survivors. Uh, we really should. I mean, th th this is, Kay is pointing out an important area, which is the tip of a, a bigger iceberg relating even to things like getting mortgage insurance, to being able to apply for, to adopt a child. Uh, there is a, a wide range of irrational irrational discriminations imposed on cancer patients, which I think need to be addressed legally. And the best way to do it would be some kind of a well-informed cancer patient's bill of rights. Look, I'm not sure if you have anything you want to say on this one. No. Um, another question here from Eunan McKinney, who's Janssen Ireland, um, makes the observation that given the level of amendments, 15,000 or so, placed before uh, the European Parliament's Becker Committee, does Matthias have any concerns that the strands of prevention proposed will be watered down and weakened? So it's a big volume of amendments being placed already. So I don't know if you have any observations on that, Matthias. Well, I think... Um... We have, well, let's let's put it that, uh, that way. Um, we have studied these amendments uh, and many of them are, um, let's say, going in the same direction. So not necessarily, uh, they are all different uh, in terms of nature. Um, of course, there is a potential that um, the, the draft may be weakened um, and this has already been um, eminent when, we, when the parliament discussed uh, the initial amendments in its recent meeting. Um, on the other side, um, I think there are also amendments and the report itself uh, has several elements that goes beyond the existing uh, Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, um, perhaps providing also a bit of leverage for the Commission to reconsider its approach if it has the backing of the Parliament. We else want to chip in on that? Okay, I want to one of our last questions now is from Neil O'Brien, who's a student in UCD, a very specific question. She wants to know if there have been any developments in relation to pancreatic cancer screening or treatment. So anything, um, recent developments in pancreatic screening or treatment. 
Um, the treatment has improved a little bit. Uh, I would have to say uh, there's still considerable scope for improvement. I think the treatment for earlier stages of pancreas cancer has improved quite a bit. The treatment for advanced disease has improved a bit too. Maybe in a different form, you might get my colleague, Professor Ray McDermott, who's a, a world authority on this uh, to speak on it. But it's, it, is be, it is emerging really as a big, stubborn challenge right now, pancreas cancer. We haven't made as much progress with it as we have in other areas. Anuka, Rachel, want to? Take this. No. I think it just illustrates the, the difference, like to go back to inequity, like even between cancers, there's such inequity in terms of survival. And um, there's so much work still to do um, in making sure that more people survive cancer. Um, and yeah, like I, I really hope that you find you find the answer to, to your question. And well, maybe one thing, and, and again, I'm, I'm not a specialist in this area, but I, I think it's also important that we move towards more tumor agnostic treatments and, and screening so that, you know, then we will be able to cover a broader range of cancers um, together. So, so that's maybe just one area also where collaboration and, and investment uh, would be beneficial. And we need a proper career structure for our researchers. Uh, we have a desperate career structure for mid-level laboratory researchers in this country. We have basically very little between the few people who become actual tenured professors and those who are postdoctoral researchers, so many of them living year by year on soft money grants. Uh, we need to fix that. And we also need to fundamentally address the issue of our medical schools not having enough full-time faculty who have large amounts of protected time and designated as part of their job description during research. Those of us who do it have had to pretty much always do it out of family time. Tyson, if anything on pancreatic cancer has come across your desk recently. Well, in, in the cancer plan, we have focused some of the project to give prior, project to give priority to uh, cancers with poor prognosis. Um, so not explicitly to pancre pancreatic cancer um, exclusively, but uh, there are several, several actions where we will focus also in terms of creating new EU networks uh, for expertise, but also in uh, looking at the repurposing of existing medicines, which should with priority look at uh, pediatric cancers and also cancers with poor uh, prognosis. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that last one last question, uh, which is kind of a broader question. Um, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, or Leyen, in her State of the Union address, she talked about proposing to develop a European health union in the coming years. Obviously, at this stage, health is still a, uh, mostly a national issue rather than a European wide issue, but the proposal on the table for the European health union. So, what areas do you think a European health union would help most in cancer policy across the EU? Um, Matthias, maybe just might give us your perspective on that one. Well, I mean, it's it's my president who said that. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> um, no, I think uh, COVID has given, let's say, new impetus to to address health also at the EU level. Um, and uh, um, the Commission president has is, is clearly uh, seized that opportunity. I think we need to keep up that momentum that we can um, proceed and really make a difference in terms of EU funding, in terms of EU collaboration and and I think we should not lose that opportunity uh, and a focus or a key issue in this is the cancer plan uh, which has the full backing of our commission and also the president of the commission any other observations from our panelists on the European health union John you uh, I, I think, you know, again, practicalities, the specifics, the deliverables, I think if it, if it did harmonize access to drugs and treatments, it would be wonderful. I think if it showed up the deficiencies in our diagnostic service, it would be wonderful. And if we had freer movement, more greater, more lubricated transfer of senior specialists between EU countries, a greater and more flexible degree, an automatic degree of recognition uh, of the training uh, of colleagues who trained in other peer EU countries, and have received senior training, you know, not making them jump too many hoops to apply for a job in Ireland. It might be one way of, uh, you know, encouraging people to try and, and fix the extraordinary, the extraordinary personnel shortage we have. Any last quick words, Rachel or Anouk? Anouk? Well, I, from my side, I, I, I really, you know, looked also at the developments under the European Health Union with a lot of uh, enthusiasm, and I, I really hope it will help to improve patient outcomes and still allow Europe to drive towards innovation. And 
Then, and then the third piece is, is a setup of the, the pandemic preparedness strategy and the agency, which I also hope will really operate based on the learnings from the COVID pandemic. And, and, and really that, you know, hopefully not in our lifetime, but that if there is a next pandemic that we are ready more quickly to collaborate and, and work together towards uh, getting treatments and, and vaccines to patients, quick, to people quickly. Yeah. Thank you, Anouk. And I'll come at the end. So I just want to say, on behalf of everybody who participated today, a big, huge thank you to our panelists, to Matthias, to Anouk, to John, and to Rachel. You, we, I mean, I'm conscious an hour and a half, and yet we only scratched the surface of many complex issues. But I think people here today, they heard a lot of challenges, but they also heard a lot of, of new ideas and new frameworks coming along, which can really help. So hopefully we've helped um, develop a few issues today that will be taken forward. So really just thank our panelists again very much for your participation today, and thank you all for participating. And that's it. Goodbye from IAA this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.